right, everyone, welcome back. I hope that by exploring the applet, you were able to get some idea about what we're about to figure out here. So I want to look at an example where we have 0 over 0. And we have two functions. I'm just going to choose x equals 3 to have a specific value that I can draw on the board here. So let's suppose that we have two functions, and both of them are going to 0 as x gets closer and closer to 3. I've tried to draw them similar to how it looked in the applet for those specific functions. So what I've tried to draw is that I'm trying to draw f to be about four times as steep as g near x equals 3. And I'm imagining that we've really zoomed in a lot here so that the graph, graphs really do look almost linear, which is what happens to any differentiable function, any function whose derivative exists, when we do zoom in really tightly on it. So we are trying to find out this limit. The limit is x goes to 3 of f of x over g of x. But it's one of these indeterminate forms because both of their y values are approaching 0. So let's see what we can figure out from this. This is where we're going to use what we did earlier this week, which was not the implicit differentiation, but the local linearization. So when I'm getting very near 3, when x is approaching 3, that's as local as you're going to get. So this is going to be essentially a perfect approximation. So what would the linear approximation be, uh, the linear lo local linearization of f of x near x equals 3 b? It's just that same formula that we used there. It's f of a, and here a is 3, plus f prime of a times x minus a. So if you look back at the linear local linearization segment, that's the formula that we used back there. And then for g, it's the same formula, except that we're using the function g instead. So we have g of 3 plus g prime of 3, x minus 3. Now we're saying that as x approaches 3, both of these are going to 0. And if we're going to be using calculus on this, we're going to need functions that are continuous. So we're going to say that these functions are continuous, which means that as x gets closer and closer to 3, if you look back to our definition of continuity from the first week, the limit has to equal the actual value at 3. So this limit has to equal f of 3, meaning f of 3 is 0 and so is g of 3. So both of these quantities are simply 0. And then what can we do? We're just going to be left with f prime of 3 over g prime of, or times x minus 3 over g prime of 3 times x minus 3. So the next natural thing to do is to cancel the x minus 3s. And what are we left with? We're just left with f prime of 3 over g prime of 3. That is to say that the ratio of the y values of the functions is the same as the ratios of their slopes. And that's because both of them were starting at x at a y value of 0 here at x equals 3. So if I start at this y value of 0, and if I go over some little distance here, the amount that the g graph will have gone up is dependent just on the slope of g, and the amount that the f graph will have gone up is dependent just on the slope of f. So as, as I tried to draw it here, f is four times as steep as g. So when I go over a little bit in the x direction, Whatever amount I go up on the g of x graph, I go up four times as much on the f of x graph. And that's because the slope of f is four times the slope of g. And that's entirely because we're starting at 0. So I tried to think of like a real life analogy for this. And imagine that you and your friend are both at the starting line of a race. In other words, you're both at a position, a y value of 0. And we want to compare how far you've gone, the ratio of how far you've gone, just a very short time later. All that matters is how fast you started off running, because that's going to tell how far you've gone, because you both started at 0. Now, if you had both started at different places, it would be a completely different story. This only works for this indeterminate form 0 over 0, this sort of uh, geometric argument here. So this is what's called L'Hopital's rule. We'll talk more about L'Hopital in a few minutes. It says. There was nothing special about 3 here. It says if the limit as x goes to any number c, or this c could even be infinity, we could say x is going to infinity, of f of x and g of x, if they're both going to 0, or they're both going to infinity. Now, we have an applet for you to explore the infinity over infinity case um, after this video, but it's hard for me to draw that on the board, of course, when we're going to infinity. If I were talking about this analogy with the running, then in that case, if you're both running off to infinity, it doesn't matter where you start. All that matters is how fast your relative speeds are. Even if your friend starts way ahead of you, if you're both going to run forever, then and you're running twice as fast as your friend, you're going to catch up, and then you're going to 
surpass your friend. It's the rate that matters. And remember, the rate is the derivative. So that's why in that case also, it's, it's the derivative. So if you get 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity, and these are the only cases where lopi tells rule works. Other fractions we already know. For example, the fraction 2 over infinity, 2 over a huge, huge number is going to be going to 0. Infinity over 2, a huge, huge number over 2, is going to be going to infinity. And then all the other fractions are ones that you studied whenever you learned fractions on flashcards in school or however you learned them. For example, the fraction 14 over 2 is just 7. We don't need any fancy calculus for that. So if we get 0 over 0 or we get infinity over infinity from this, what this argument tells us and what the applet we hope helped you see is that the ratio of the y values should be the same as the ratios of their slopes. That is to say, the ratios of their derivatives. And it's, we have to make one special condition if this latter limit exists. So it's possible for this first limit to exist and this latter limit not to exist, in which case the rule doesn't apply because we can't have, they're not going to be equal in that case. Let's talk about L'Hôpital for a second here. So L'Hôpital was a wealthy Frenchman in the time when Leibniz was just, Leibniz's work was just being spread around uh, Europe. And it was being spread mainly by the Bernoulli brothers. We had seen Jacob Bernoulli when we did the Lemniscate of Bernoulli. That was his, his, uh, his Lemniscate. He had a brother, Johann Bernoulli. And Johann was basically hired by L'Hôpital. Johann and, and Jacob were not wealthy like L'Hôpital was. So let me just read you a little bit of a letter that came from L'Hôpital to Johann Bernoulli. It starts off where uh, L'Hôpital is telling Johann Bernoulli what sort of annual pension, as he calls it, some, something like a commit, monetary commitment, a salary that he's going to be paying to Johann Bernoulli. And L'Hôpital goes on to say, I shall ask you to give me occasionally some hours of your time to work on what I shall ask you, and this is the key thing, and also to communicate to me your discoveries with the request not to mention them to others. I also ask you to send neither to some people nor to others copies of the notes that you have let me hear, for it would not please me if they were made public. So they did this. And L'Hôpital wanted to learn calculus. That was the point of, of doing this. He, he learned calculus from Johann Bernoulli. And L'Hôpital then went on to publish the first calculus textbook. And we're going to give you a link to that on the website. In that textbook, L'Hôpital published this rule, which had never been seen before. Bernoulli, Johann Bernoulli, came up with, it, with this rule as he was teaching L'Hôpital calculus. And then L'Hôpital published it in the very first calculus book ever, which had, was published by L'Hôpital. And so naturally, people gave L'Hôpital the credit for this. And that is why it came to be known as L'Hôpital's rule. And Bernoulli stuck to the bargain. Um, we have a link to this article for you on the website. But as it says here, after the publication of the textbook in 1696, Bernoulli wrote to L'Hôpital praising the work for its sound arrangements of propositions and for the intelligibility of the exposition. So you know, Bernoulli seemed to be happy with this. Bernoulli then started to change his mind a little bit as L'Hôpital started to get all of his credit for this. And in fact, after L'Hôpital died, Bernoulli was still alive. And Bernoulli did start to tell people that uh, this had really been his discovery. But it wasn't until Bernoulli's papers were published in the 1950s that the whole mathematical community came to agree that, in fact, this probably should have been called Bernoulli's rule. But the name L'Hôpital's rule has stuck. And so that's the name that we give it. You will sometimes see L'Hôpital spelled differently than this, um, often without this S and maybe with a uh, mark above the O. But if you, as you can see on the website, this is the way that L'Hôpital actually spelled his own name on the cover of the textbook that he wrote. And so this is the spelling that now, for example, the Advanced Placement College Board has decided to go with. They've changed from a different spelling in the past. And so I'm also going to try to use this spelling from now on. And as promised, we now have an applet for you to go and explore with uh, the infinity over infinity case. And we'll come back and we'll practice some with L'Hôpital's rule.